Next from the state capitol, SIU President Glenn Pichard testifies before the House Appropriations Committee on Higher Education. President Pichard tells lawmakers about the drastic steps the universities had to take to cut costs due to the state's late payments. This runs about 40 minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. It's an honor for us to be before you today to present uh, uh, our presentation before the Appropriations Committee. I have with me Dr. Dwayne Stuckey, who is our Vice President for Financial Affairs, and Paula Keith, who is the Executive Assistant to the President. She actually um, allows Dr. Stuckey and I to think that we run the university. <laughs> Everybody knows how, how the staff does. Mr. Chairman, uh, just to help the committee understand our mission or our niche in the state of Illinois, uh, of Illinois um, higher education community, uh, we've passed out to the committee uh, this handout, which I would like to go over rather quickly. Uh, and this pertains to the Illinois Board of Higher Education's goals uh, for all of us at the university level. Um, the first uh, piece of the handout, the first page, delineates the geography of wealth in Illinois. And as you can see, the very dark areas are areas that have the highest unemployment, the worst health care, um, the lowest uh, uh, income level of the people in the state of Illinois. Southern Illinois University Carbondale is located at the bottom of that triangle and as you can see we are surrounded with a per capita income of from $10,742 to $19,993 uh, and slightly above that in some cases as we get a little bit up to our north uh, the nineteen dollars to $23,000 a year figure. Uh, we recruit heavily from this area. It is predominantly white. Uh, our Edwardsville campus sits up in the uh, more yellowish or tan area, uh, which has a per capita income of $23,900 to $29,000 a year. We recruit heavily in the highest unemployed area of the state, and as well as uh, very heavily in the city of Chicago. So this sort of delineates uh, the wealthier areas of the state, the Metro East area, the Central Illinois area, and in the green shade are the highest uh, per capita incomes in the state. Uh, in the document uh, of the IBHE, A Tale of Two States, they talk about the two different Illinois that exist. One Illinois is well off, well educated, economically dynamic, with a seemingly bright future. It's prosperous, educated, economically healthy. The other Illinois struggles to make ends meet. It lags in educational attainment. It's economically stagnant. Illinois' prosperity is uneven and declining. Many Illinoisans are left behind by the education system. The educational attainment and demographic trends portend serious economic consequences. Illinois' economic health is in jeopardy. Uh, we risk pricing students out of post-secondary education because any rise in tuition and fees to our students because of the lesser amount we've been appropriated over the past five or six years from the state uh, just drives up the cost of those poorer families as a percentage of their family income to pay for their students' education. You can see that there is a leaky student pipeline in this state. Uh, there are wide geographic disparities in educational attainment. Residents of many Chicago suburbs and certain pockets of downstate Illinois are far better educated than others living in inner city and rural areas. Now, this prosperity gap is wide and it's getting wider between the two Illinois. It is the direct, direct result of disparities in educational attainment by race, ethnicity, income, and region. If you look at the next page, again, this comes from the IBHE. If you look at this next page, you can see that this begins in elementary school. The Illinois math exams, this is by fourth grade, 
shows that 91% of the white students are meeting uh, criteria, 54% of the African American students, and 64% of the Hispanic students. But there's a 37% per attain achievement gap between African American and white students at that level in math and it follows in reading. And the national figures uh, are, are, are almost the same as the state figures, although a little bit higher. This prosperity gap between the two Illinois that are delineated in this study worsens by middle school. It now becomes an achievement gap. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the same thing, Illinois math, Illinois reading, you can see that the disparities grow larger, not smaller, between these two different Illinois. Uh, and when you get the high school graduation, where you see the, the first major leak, 84% of white students graduate uh, high school, 52% of African Americans, 60% of Hispanic, and 96% Asian. If you look at the achievement gap now, which is the next page, that persists through college graduation, you will see that those disparities continue at the same rate nearly as they did beginning in elementary, middle school, and high school. And this, this prosperity gap between the two Illinois is directly responsible for the achievement gap that persists all the way through college graduation. And, and that is untenable for the state of Illinois to maintain this kind of superstructure. Our university speaks to the gap. We recruit kids from the most economically depressed area of the state, as well as uh, a great number of our students come from the city of Chicago in areas that are also economically depressed. Our mission calls for uh, equal opportunity for all of our students. Trying to close the gap, as the Illinois Board of Higher Education has told us, this is their number one priority. Our university stands in the gap. We believe that we give these students opportunity opportunity to make something out of themselves, to get a good education. Now, does that mean they're going to have as high graduation rates as those students who come from the more prosperous areas of the state where there is no achievement gap? No. We accept that. They start from educational systems that are poor, that, that are not up to par with the rest of the state but we try to fill the gap as best we can, while at the same time our mission requires us to be a major public research institution. And we have to maintain that level also. So both areas are important to our university. If you look at the tuition, you can see that Illinois Public University's increase in annual tuition, FY06 through 13, was 7.4% a year. Carbondale, it was 6.4%. Edwardsville, 6.8%. Those are the lowest among our peer groups in the state for each university, among four-year institutions. So we've kept tuition low because we know we're recruiting in areas where families have the least ability for economic wherewithal to support their students, to a large part. Now, the question has come up about how do we evaluate ourselves in the midst of this, as every public university must. Well, what we do, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, is the first thing we look at is our expenses and our budget. And I have a sheet here, we didn't pass it out to you, but I just want to read you uh, the state appropriations and the income fund budget for our university. It's 229, uh, well, this year it's $204 million that we get from the state. As of this moment, we are owed $149 million of that $204 million, and we're three months to the end of the fiscal year. That's how far behind the state is 
in cash flow for us. We've received 21% of our funding so far, and we're three months to the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so, so when we break our expenses down, 74.87% of our expenses are for salaries. That's three-fourths of our money that's already spent on salaries. 16.64% <clears throat> are on fixed cost. These are things that we, 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 you know, we do our best to try to control group health insurance, Medicare, audit expenses, library materials, disability accommodations, and so on. But that, that puts us at 90% nearly of our income expenses that are already set in stone. We have another 6.75% that pertains to uh, other, other things we have with respect to online education and paying fees and online uh, MVAs and so on. 1.14% are for essential equipment purchases, and one and six tenths of one percent are for contractual services. We don't have money to waste. We've been cut from two hundred and forty-eight million dollars in two thousand two to two hundred and four million this year, and with the governor's proposed budget, we'll be cut another ten million dollars. So we will have gone from in ten years. Uh, a $50 million annual decrease in our appropriations from the state. At the same time, we're trying to educate students that require the maximum resources from the university. Now, uh, 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 we've held tuition low. We get research grants from the federal government, mainly from the National Institute of Health for our medical school, for our departments of engineering, uh, science, and so on. Every year we sit down and the board and the president make out the goals that speak to the highest priorities of our university system. The very highest priorities, because we can't cover everything every year. We know that. How do we get evaluated on those goals and our outcomes on the goals? We have the Higher Learning Commission that comes in once every 10 years and evaluates every public university in this state. We have received nothing but the highest recommendations from the HLC. We just got reaccredited for 10 years. And they come in and spend days and days and days with their teams. They look at everything from finances to educational quality. The HLC, the state, has performance-based funding that they have implemented, which we're trying now in our second year to meet, although it's difficult with the clientele that we seek to serve. Uh, but, but we do our best to meet those, plus the state has evaluation units that come in for the different colleges and so on, and, and evaluates their goals and their progress. The college units themselves have accrediting agencies for the medical school, the law school, the dental school, the pharmacy school, and so on, that are outside agencies. The, the chancellors and I sit down twice a year and look at progress reports that come directly from the goals that are established by the board and myself. So I know at any given time, the progress that we're making on our goals, our objectives that we've set out for the year. Now, financial performance. Uh, we can prove that our educational quality is high by virtue that we get evaluated on all these things, but with respect to financial performance, uh, even in the decline in state appropriations, even in the delay in state payments from the, from the state, uh, the, the Bain report, which came out last year, Bain Financial Group, who does tremendous amount of business with universities across the country, they did their own evaluation of, of uh, public universities and private universities published in the Chronicle of Higher Education. They ranked us in the top of the top 20% for financial management in the country, in the entire country. We, we, uh, we have maintained uh, financial integrity through all of this, but at what expense? We've now laid off over 500 people. Not laid them off, but we couldn't replace them when they retired. 
It's the only way that we could cut expenses enough, given that 75% of our expenses are salaries. It's the only way that we could keep our head above water financially. We've cut back on everything. Please add Representative Halbrook and as Representative, well as Leader Boss, Mike Boss, okay. to the roll. Hi, Representative. Uh, so we received outstanding reports from the Bain Group, which has major investments in public universities and private universities. Moody's has uh, had until this week uh, our, our uh, level at A2 stable. When the state got downgraded to A2 negative in December, we knew that it was going to follow that we would be downgraded at some point in time. This past week, every public university in this state was downgraded at least one step. And we were downgraded to A2 negative, one step. That's all. So, so you, you know, that followed with the state's decline. S&P still rates us at A, A plus stable. Uh, the Auditor General every year audits all of our finances through outside firms. We yet to have a major finding. We have a couple of material findings each year, usually involving federal grants that we didn't cross all the T's or I's on. But, but the Auditor General has substantiated that and the Higher Learning Commission itself. So Mr. Chairman, all I'm saying is, is that educational quality, we can prove that our educational quality is high. Financial stability, financial management, we can prove that our financial management has been solid and successful in getting through this worst economic time, at least financially, in the state's history. And, and so, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go all the way around the barn to say all this, but it's important for me that the committee understands that, that we have a niche in this state uh, and we try to fulfill it as best we can. We make no excuses for it. And we have solid financial management. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. President. Dr. Pichard, um, I appreciate your passion as it relates to educating our kids and really speaking very candidly about the two separate Illinoisans. Yes, sir. The haves and the have-nots. Yes. And that, it's all centered around education. Um, and I'm sure that there, there are lots of questions from members here. You certainly know what my political disposition is as it relates to black kids, white kids, brown kids, poor kids, and giving them access to opportunity to close that socioeconomic gap. Right. And so when you see abject violence in the city of Chicago, it's directly correlated with education or the lack thereof. Yes. So, as well as other poor areas of the state, Mr. Absolutely. Chairman. Absolutely, 100 percent correct. Uh, but, but you know, I have to look at this from a universal mindset. What if we don't do anything about that gap? What if we don't do anything about solving these problems that are caused by lack of educational attainment? The prosperity gap equals the achievement gap. My question to you is, how is this Moody's invest, investors uh, downgrade? In, has, has there been an immediate impact on the university? Let Dr. Stuckey answer that, sir. There's, there's no immediate impact. Uh, we, are, uh, uh, we were planning on going out for some more debt financing this uh, next fiscal year, early this next fiscal year. We're reconsidering that very strongly now in, in light of this. Uh, uh, that, that would have be the biggest impact. It would just, uh, we, may, we may choose not to go out in the market uh, as quickly as we were. We owe you, I'm sorry, I just want some clarification, $27 million? State appropriations? 149, 100, excuse, 149. Me, excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm turning around. I have a lot of numbers in front of me here. Yeah. Now, just for the record, typically, we, we make that, that those payments bef by the end of the fiscal year? By law, uh, it's done by the end of December now. It used to be by the end of August, and two or three years ago, uh, yeah, that was changed to the end of December. So you are required to make the full payment to us by the end of December right now, unless the General Assembly 
uh, decides to uh, to uh, uh, push that out farther. Okay. I want to add Representative Jahan Gordon to the row. Um, my second question is, uh, the Department of, uh, uh, as, representative, as well as Representative Laura Fine, um, my understanding that the um, Department of Financial and, and Professional Regulation is advocating the removal of uh, pharmaceutical funds um, from SI, SIU and the U of I and CSU, actually, um, yes, as, as indicated by the governor's introduced budget. Um, you know, with the plan being essentially um, to shift costs to the university's income fund, uh, can you talk about, in your opinion, the impact of the, this current proposal? I know you highlighted it earlier, but what's going to be the direct impact? On the pharmaceutical grant? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> that grant was established uh, when our pharma pharmaceutical school was established. It has uh, been in longer standing, I think, for the U of I and then Chicago State. Um, had their pharmacy come online. Uh, it's $1,250,000. It's uh, given the, the deep cuts from state appropriations, uh, also the, uh, the cost that we are going to have to assume when the cost shift takes place on pensions, the sequestration at the federal level, which is going to continue to reduce our research funds and our student uh, 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 assistance, needs assistance, grants and Pell Grant and so on. Given that, a million two hundred and fifty thousand dollar loss, sir, to uh, our system, which will now come out of our operations budget, to pay for that is really a huge burden. Uh, it's just one more thing that we're being asked to pick up now. Uh, we were always in one fund, uh, I can't remember the names of the funds right now, up until about three years ago, and our financing for that pharmacy was pushed to another fund when they said that fund, uh, uh, we needed to change funds. Well, now what we're being told is both of those funds are defunct, uh, that m money has uh, dried up and there's no longer any money to support our pharmacy. And uh, we're the only pharmacy south of Champaign uh, in the entire state. Our kids have usually had to go out of state uh, to uh, pharmacies, and this has been a great boost. By the way, Mr. Chairman, 100% of our pharmacy graduates, uh, graduates attain their board certification when they pass the test, their certification test for becoming pharmacists. 100%. And they've done it before. It's, a, it's an excellent pharmacy school. Was that for last year or, or the yes, last year? Yes, sir. Last year. Every... Yes, year. Really? Yes, sir. That's impressive. Yeah. How, how large this is year, the actually, school? This year, I'm sorry. How many students do you have there? Oh, golly. Um, I'm going to say on the order of uh, 60 to 70. You know, That's it's, it's That's impressive. Maybe, maybe more than that, sir. I'm just not. Sure. Fantastic. Rep Representative Dwight K. for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, President Pichard, welcome today. Uh, I'd like to divide my time into uh, maybe just some, some comments to, to lay some foundation here because maybe many in this room don't know you. Um, you understate uh, your presence in the state and you understate the work that you have done for SIUE and Carbondale. Uh, you are the one person and one person alone that I never hear any criticism about. Uh, in fact, what I hear is all the good things you do, and that's unusual in this state because we uh, tend to nitpick a lot. We are very political and we find ways to uh, find something wrong with someone at any given point in time. Uh, that's not the case with you, and that says to me that you are focused on one thing and one thing alone, and that's providing a good education at a good price to our students in, in southern Illinois. Uh, you also forgot to tell us how prominent uh, the various schools that you have are. And let me, let me just begin for a second. Your pharmacy school, top-notch. Yes, sir. Top-notch. Uh, dental school, one of the best in the nation. Yep. One of the best in the nation. It is. And, and that, that's not arguable. That's, that's a fact. Right. 
Uh, your, your medical school, I don't know as much about, but I hear very, very good things, and I understand that your students are very successful. And finally, your engineering school may be as competitive as any may be as competitive as any engineering school in the Midwest. In fact, it may go beyond that. Uh, let me just add a personal note to this. I have a daughter who just graduated from your nursing school. Uh, she had, contrary to what you hear, she had uh, nine job offers. She accepted one at Barnes Jewish. It pays very well. <laughs> Barnes Jewish said that SIUE has one of the best schools and they love to have the graduates. Um, so I've also had a relative who taught in the engineering department and in national competitions that the engineering department has. Uh, SIUE generally wins that competition. In fact, I think they've won it three of the last five years, maybe four of the last five years. So what you're telling me today, uh, you, again, you understated it, and you're a humble guy, I know yeah. that. You understated the success of the university and what you've done for it. Now, let me, let me get into some questions here for just a second. The $149 million that you're owed, how far back does that go? Well, we were paid for FY12 by the end of December uh, last year. So it goes, it's this fiscal year, starting July 1st of, of last year. And to make up for the, the delay in payment, have you borrowed money? I'll let Dr. Stuckey speak to those. No, we, we don't have the authority to borrow for operating purposes. What, do you have a rainy day fund? Yes. Uh, the, uh, starting with the fall of 09, when, when we began to see the, st the state uh, delay payments more and more, Dr. Bouchard took up to begin to uh, delay payments, uh, accumulate, accumulate more cash reserves, delay payments to, to vendors as much as we could, uh, put on a hiring freeze, uh, and we began to, uh, we didn't call it a rainy day fund, but our cash balances began to improve. Sure. In fact, they're better now than they were three years ago. So how long can you operate on, on this principle or on your philosophy? Well, uh, if the state continues, uh, this year uh, the state has been, uh, uh, actually, it, we, we can expect payment more regularly. They haven't caught up, but uh, the comptroller's office attempts to give us so much per month, 5% per month during the, the fiscal year. That helps our, with our planning uh, very much. Uh, and as long as the delays don't get any more than they are now, we, 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 we see now that we've been able to manage this for a couple of years. We can continue to manage, manage it, uh, but we do have to have, uh, uh, we need to be made whole by the end of December. 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 This year. Yes. And Representative and then, Kay, if yes. the reason that we, uh, we've always had a reserve fund to cover any possible losses of funds from the state, but we've upped that considerably during the last few years because the delays in payments have gotten longer and longer and the appropriations have been cut deeper and deeper. But, you know, uh, while we have reserves, if we have an electrical feeder, let's say, go out on either one of our campuses, we might be spending two and a half million dollars to fix it. So, you know, our, our Carbondale campus was established in the 1860s. And so we have a lot of things that have gone wrong since President Morris built new buildings in the 40s and 50s. And, uh, and, and so we have no money to spare except what we're able to set aside uh, to, to take care of major repairs and so on if we have to. Which brings me to my next point. If you're going to receive 10 million less this year than you did last year, your problem just becomes greater. Oh, absolutely. And your rainy day fund, can it cover all no, the, no. Okay. We can't cover those kinds of. So problems. you're you're sort of in a crisis mode here. Is that correct? I think every public university in this state is, sir, because it's not indigenous to us. Every public university is right. suffering the same fate. It's just harder for us, given our mission and and uh, and so on, uh, because enrollment has fallen on the Carbondale campus. Uh, we've, we've lost, uh, as uh, uh, Representative Cavalletto mentioned, 
We have a uh, declining population. In the last uh, 20 some odd years, our population in Southern Illinois has fallen uh, by 1.3%. Instead of staying stable or growing, it's actually going down. High school students, we have uh, hundreds of less high school students now than we had over the past several years because of the declining state population. We're surrounded in that triangle by three states, all of whom recruit our best students in Southern Illinois. I mean, there's, there's many uh, disparities here that we have to contend with that maybe universities in other parts of the state do not have to. With respect to the 500 people that you have laid off, what percent were professors or what number of individuals were professors or associates? Yeah, uh, a small percentage. Uh, the biggest percent are, are uh, people in civil service in those areas, uh, but we have not replaced. Uh, faculty tends to stay on and not retire as early, and so we haven't, uh, we ha we haven't let a lot of faculty go, but we've had to That's let good. a lot of civil service people go. Now, my recollection is that uh, U.S. News and World Report ranked you very high. Is that correct? They ranked us as one of the best buys. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Princeton Review ranked us in, in terms of our peer groups, ranked us as one of the best uh, buys in the Midwest. And U.S. News and World Report uh, had us rated in the third tier of public research universities in the nation, which is pretty good. I'd say you know. it's excellent. Yeah. Now, I guess, uh, and again, I'm not, this is not a leading question, but with that in mind and everything else that we've talked about today about the excellent reputation that both campuses have, I understand that there is an issue that may impede progress at these institutions and it has to do with trustees. Can you tell me a little bit about that? We have, we have dismissed or not reappointed trustees. And I'm curious about how that's going to impact the SIU community. Because I happen to know a few of these people, and they're good people, they're smart people, and they were on a job just like you are. And I'd like to know your candid opinion as to how this will affect the SIU community. Well, I think it's had a very detrimental effect on the SIU community. We've always enjoyed uh, good board relationships between the Metro East area, where our Edwardsville campus is located, and the southern end of the state. Um, when the governor uh, told us that we should make one of the trustees two years ago chairman who had not been on the board, um, I had to go ask the trustees that were presently serving to back this gentleman. Um, and uh, they didn't want to do that because the three Metro East people were all senior members, uh, Dr. Ed Hightower, John Simmons, and Marquita Wiley. And they were all in line, one or the other, if they wanted to be chairman of the senior members. Um, <clears throat> And uh, they capitulated to the governor to make this gentleman uh, chairman of our trustees because I asked them to, because the governor's office asked me to do it, to make sure that they voted for him. And they did. Um, they didn't necessarily like it, but they voted for him. And uh, within six months, the board was totally split. Uh, there were a lot of demands that were made upon the Metro East members as well as myself that uh, were not policy considerations. They dealt with personnel, they dealt with search committees, they dealt with things of, of a nature that boards don't usually get involved in. And um, as it happened, uh, <clears throat> The second time uh, the gentleman came up to be chairman, uh, the Metro East members would not support him uh, in any way because of what had transpired. And uh, 
elected one of their own, at which time they were threatened and told that the governor would take them off the board. Uh, when, and, and that's precisely what happened. Um, members of the governor's staff called me and um, they called other board members trying to get them to reinstate this gentleman as chairman. Um, they would not do that because of the disastrous year that we had had. Um, I was called again uh, and told that those people were to vote for the chairman. I told them uh, I would not ask other trustees to do that again. I did it one time and it turned out to be uh, a split board. Uh, <clears throat> so now we've come to the point where, uh, as was said by the chairman, the three Metro East members were dismissed by the governor. and. Um, and uh, there was no conversation. It was unceremoniously done. Uh, there was no thank you for the years of service that they had performed. And now we have an absolutely divided communities. Uh, and that, um, that's unfortunate for us because we've had a strong system. We've had great boards. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the future portends. Uh, at this point in time, but um, you know, I'm here to be president of the university and to try to protect the integrity of the university. Well, and no and, matter what. And President Prashar, is it fair to say at this point in time, this very day, the needs of UE are going unmet? Well, they're not going unmet from. <clears throat> excuse me, sir. They're not going on met, unmet from an administrative point of view or a faculty point of view, but there is no one on the board right now that, that has had a past with SIU Edwardsville, uh, either as a student or um, a graduate or, or anything like that. So let me, let me just sum up here because I can sense that Representative Duncan is, is wanting me to finish. We have a nationally recognized news publication or two who say this is one of the finest universities. We know we have one of the finest dental schools, medical schools, pharmacy schools, engineering schools. And by the way, you have one of the finest chairmen in, in Julie Bow. I, I mean, she's yes, a wonderful, she's very good. wonderful chancellor who is meeting the need of people who might not get an education otherwise, but for the fact that you keep your costs down and you provide good education. And you've run what I would say a, is a good business enterprise, educationally speaking. So now we have a governor who's decided, and you correct me if I'm wrong, we have a governor who's decided that we're going to play politics as opposed to doing business the right way, the successful way, because he has an interest in one individual and not the interest of many individuals. And I'm talking about the students and the professors and people like you who've tried to make this institution what it is and done a good job. Is that a fair statement? Well, I, I don't want to uh, I, I, I don't want to make a, a judgment here. I can only describe to you the facts of what's happened. Uh, it's our hope <clears throat> that the situation will be corrected in a, in a way that's uh, fair and equitable to both campus, uh, both universities. Um, we're still hopeful that that will happen. Ms. But Pres there's Ms. still Pres attempts to uh, put the previous chairman back in as chairman. Mr. President, let me just say this, <clears throat> and, and again, admittedly, I'm an admirer of yours because of what you've done. Uh, I understand who you are, and you're a good man, but there's a lot of good men. But it's what you've done as a good man that impresses me. I think what the governor has done in this situation is unconscionable. He can't defend it, and it's politics at its worst. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Mr. President, Yes, sir. Uh, I share a lot of the, the positive sentiments that uh, was addressed or pointed out earlier today. Um, I'm very familiar with your dental program, your medical school, 
um, your engineering program, your nursing, your pharmaceutical, um, you're at the apex, not here in the state, but across the country. You know where you are, certainly in all of our hearts as it relates to your success, and we're going to be looking to work with you. Uh, just sort of FYI, we have not set a hard standard uh, reductions, if at all. Yes, sir. We are, myself and uh, Representative Hammond and others who are on the appropriations committees, we are looking to have at least funding remain flat. Mr. Chairman, that's all we ask for. If we could receive stable funding, that, that would be great. I mean, we'll take it. We're trying to do our part as best we can to help the state on the pensions and other issues. But if we could just get stable funding, you can't un believe how much that would be helpful to us. Thank you, Mr. Pichard and your team. Best of success. We'll be visiting pretty soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you, members of the committee. We appreciate it. The Illinois Channel's coverage of legislative issues is underwritten in part by AARP Illinois.